I'd like to invite this second panel up. Um, we're going to talk about AI and content. How can we stop the theft and save journalism? And we'll hear from Chris Argentieri, who's the president and COO of the LA Times, and Kai Falkenberg, general counsel for The Guardian US and a lecturer at Columbia Law School. So please take a seat. And as we're, they're getting settled, we'll hear some remarks from Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut. Hi, I'm Blumenthal, United States Senator for Connecticut. Really excited and grateful to be joining you for this very, very important conversation and regret that I'm unable to be with you in person. But thank you to the Open Markets Institute and to The Guardian for bringing us together so that we can really think forward about how to deal with some of the challenges to journalism, particularly local journalism, democracy, free elections. One of the greatest threats is the disinformation and misinformation that can result from the use of artificial intelligence. And we've been grappling with this issue in the United States Senate, most especially on the Judiciary Committee. I head a subcommittee, Privacy, Tech, and the Law, that has been focusing through hearings on artificial intelligence. The threats, but also the great promise. Not just the perils, but also the tremendous benefits that we can achieve in this area of democracy and journalism. Impersonation, deep fakes, voice cloning, tremendously scary and challenging. That's why I've been working on a bipartisan framework. It's the only comprehensive bipartisan framework for legislation with the ranking member of that subcommittee, Josh Hawley of Missouri. He's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. We need bipartisan cooperation to deal with the promise and the perils of artificial intelligence. And what we have in mind is a regimen similar to the one that applies to pharmaceutical drugs where a new drug has to be evaluated with clinical trials and judged to be safe and effective before it is released to be sold on the market. Safe and effective. Well, we may not use that standard and we may not need a new entity in the government, but the idea of oversight, licensing, and independent judgment about how to apply AI is analogous to what we've seen in the pharmaceutical drug area, in genetics, in atomic energy, and eventually it has to be international in scope. So we are working together on legislation. We invite your views to make sure that democracy and journalism, the free exchange of ideas and accuracy without misinformation, without voice cloning or deep fakes, becomes the norm. If there is a need to identify AI with watermarks digitally, it should be done. And the idea of oversight and some regulatory framework is one that I think has to be done. It has to be done quickly because AI is moving fast, as you well know and it's already outpacing the democratic principles and leaders who have a responsibility to make sure that it is used wisely and well. Thank you for thinking about these issues and for giving me an opportunity to comment. Thank you. And thank you to Senator Blumenthal for kind of kicking off this, what I consider one of the most important issues in AI because it fundamentally links to mis- and disinformation, the integrity of our information environment. And so, you know, before we jump into the conversation, just to level set for the audience, is journalism is an essential source of data for all of the foundation models that underpin, um, that are used to develop and train generative artificial intelligence systems and to make generative search, content summarization, answer engines, et cetera these consumer-facing applications relevant and timely. 
We have lots of stats. There's a report in the back. You can pick it up if you're interested. Um, so big tech and, and other AI companies that aren't big yet, but nonetheless are getting billion dollar valuations, are claiming the right for the unfettered use of news content without compensation, which is of course threatening the sustainability of trustworthy and quality journalism and the overall health of the information ecosystem, similar in the ways that social media appended the business models of journalism. We're seeing that I think replicate, replicated and even more dangerous um, in this new um, evolution. And so, you know, as we've seen AI summaries are integrated into search engines, online publishers, and we'll hear more from you about experiencing a decline in referral traffic, um, while the revenues, of course, of the dominant AI companies that depend on these inputs are starting to grow. So as we discuss how we can stop the theft of journalism by tech and AI, platforms and why this is critical to democracy and, and what types of public policies we need to survive. Um, Chris, let me start with you. you. We understand the LA Times has not yet made a deal. It also has not yet sued um, any of the big tech or AI firms like Perplexity, um, which have developed multi-billion dollar companies, uh, valuations by scraping data from publisher websites and even from behind paywalls. Meanwhile, quality journalistic outlets like your own have had to lay off hundreds of employees and historic job cuts. Um, should we be thinking about this as theft? Is it theft? For sure, yeah. I, I don't think there'd be another example if you, uh, an organization that uh, develops content in our case spends a significant amount of money, invests resources both human and economic, uh, to try to report the news the right way with the right amount of rigor. Uh, it's extremely costly. Our intention is to build an audience and monetize that audience for another organization to be able to steal it um, uh, and use it to do the same thing, build an audience, monetize it through really the same channels, advertising the same. Uh, but also our version of selling subscriptions, which we sell for cash, uh, their currency is data that they harvest from, you know, citizens around the world. Um, so for another organization to take a product uh, that's been developed and monetize it to a extreme degree without any uh, compensation for the originator, I'm not sure that goes on uh, in any other industry. I'm pretty sure that Pfizer can't have a drug stolen from them by Merck, go sell it, uh, to do the same thing, and there's no recourse. Yeah, it seems to me when um, kind of smaller, less powerful, or poorer actors take something that is not theirs, um, it's called theft. But when large, powerful corporations like big tech do it, it's called innovation. <laughs> so. Kai, how, you know, The Guardian also has not pursued litigation or licensing. Um, we know there's, you know, legislation, there are kind of three prongs that we need to address uh, this information crisis. So litigation, licensing, and legislation. From your perspective, how are you thinking about prioritizing those? Are you thinking, you know, for The Guardian, are you guys going to sue? Are you going to license? Are you you know, trying to get any specific legislation passed? We're focused on all three of those fronts, all three L's, as you, as you put it. On the litigation front, we're following very closely the lawsuits that have been filed, not just by the news publishing industry, but the others follow, filed by um, Getty and uh, the other image rights holders, as well as the music industry, including the, the lawsuit that was just filed uh, earlier this week. Um, and all of the various claims that are involved, uh, in particular in the news publishing lawsuits brought by the Times, brought by the uh, Intercept and the Alden papers, including the Daily News, um, on the copyright infringement and um, the arguable fair use defense asserted by OpenAI and Microsoft, um, but the other tangential claims as well, including claims like trademark dilution that arise from uh, hallucination um, and uh, inaccurate, you know, misinformation that's being outputted by the models. 
Um, so we're tracking that. Uh, and the other claims like uh, the removal of copyright uh, management information, which is the claim at issue uh, in the case brought by uh, The Intercept. Um, uh, and um, we're very mindful of um, all of the um, evidence of regurgitation and memorization um, that were included as exhibits um, in those litigations um, as evidence that the outputs um, were substantially similar and therefore arguably infringing. Um, so very interested uh, in those cases. There are uh, also uh, claims that have been brought in the UK um, on copyright infringement and uh, claims that are being considered in the EU as well. Um, so we're focused on all of those efforts um, and the viability of those claims. Um, on the legislation front, you know, interested in Senator Blumenthal's um, thoughts and his uh, efforts to pursue bipartisan uh, initiatives um, on comprehensive AI uh, regulation. Um, we've been hearing about potential bills that would directly relate to claims that news publishers could bring on the unauthorized use and scraping of our content. So we're very pleased to hear uh, that there are efforts afoot to bring um, those claims. We're also interested in potential causes of action that essentially would uh, resuscitate what had been called the hot news claim. Um, so basically free riding on our content and investment in our content, uh, which is what Chris talked about. Um, so we're interested in um, seeing those um, legislative efforts gain momentum. On the licensing front, um, similar to, I'm sure, the LA Times, we've expressed our concerns to the various uh, companies that are stealing our content um, very strenuously um, and uh, have let them know that we are prepared to pursue legal action if it comes to that. But we're also open to discussions around compensation. Um, and if we are fairly compensated, um, that's something that we might uh, be willing to consider. I think, um, you know, one of the things to consider is some of the legislation that's already in place or under consideration. So what Australia passed, the News Media Bargaining Code, Canada's Online News Act, the proposed legislation at the federal and uh, state level in California, where <clears throat> these News Media Bargaining Codes that could be read to include the scraping and crawling of web content and therefore require negotiation um, with publishers for the right to that content. Um, but how are you able to figure out your negotiating position and how much value you have, how to ha even have those negotiations, when you don't have information either about the deals that are being made. I mean, there's very little public information. I think what we've been able to glean is like most of the open AI deals seem to be about one to $5 million. There are some very big deals with News Corp and AP. Um, but how, how are you thinking about what information you need to establish value and do you think that's sufficient? And is that going to enable you to have a business model that will sustain the act of journalism, and maybe Chris, I'll, I'll go to you th with that first since you're involved in the California situation. Yeah, I, I think the legislation is important um, in that there, there is a mechanism, I think, to be used to value uh, content that is driven off of the revenue that these platforms generate. So whether it's the JCPA federally or the bill in California, that's a little more clear when it comes to the use of our content or anybody's in these large language models, that's very difficult to do because there isn't a market established for that. Um, and there isn't a market established for what? For licensing? Well, there's a belief amongst the, these providers that they have the ability to steal the content to train models uh, by arguing fair use. But one of the so, pillars of fair use is that there is a market and we're seeing companies creating, you know, they're establishing market, they're establishing now, market and, and well, they're licensing. Isn't that proof of a market? Uh, yeah, I think if these agreements were um, public, uh, you would see that what the compensation for is, I'm sure the technology companies are being released from their use of the 
content for training, I highly doubt that the compensation is pointed specifically towards training because with uh, litigation going on, they're not going to admit that they need the content to train. The argument is it's these models are built on the relationship of words. No single source of words is enough to mean anything. Um, my counter to that is, but you got to have something. So you know they can split us all up, carve us all off, and nobody's important. No individual entity is important. To me, the uh, better solution that would provide an ability to negotiate is uh, copyright law and the idea that, um, I mean, this is not transformative use. This is, uh, they're building a product with our content that replaces ours, uh, not transformative use. It is also not fair use. We have the ability as a democracy to pass a law, just like copyright law lists some presumptive uses. I don't know the right legal or grammatical term, but we should, it's within the power of the United States government to create a law to list what is non-presumptive use or that you can't do this. It's clear you can't, logical people would agree, but going through the courts when you're armed with the best attorneys money can buy and reams of them and multiple firms, there's very few organizations that have a realistic chance to pursue this through the courts against uh, enterprises like Google. Um, they're as well funded as they are and uh, um, there's also been a, a tremendous amount of bad precedent over the years that we continue to go back and point to a Perfect 10 magazine case that says you can use images, our photos, that we have paid for to generate, that we own, no question about it, and because they're in a thumbnail, which they're not even in a thumbnail anymore on Google, that that is somehow transformative. There's no reason to click on those photos to leave their platform, yet that is still used as precedent uh, to further dilute copyright law. Well, I guess we'll just have to hope that the Supreme Court overturns some more precedent as they have with some of our other fundamental rights. But let's not go there today. <laughs> Can I just speak to evaluation uh, yeah, for a second? Please. Um, so first of all, we know that they need our high quality content and we know that they need it for current information, right? Because the models are trained on information that's not current and to do the retrieval augmented generation that uh, is responsive to news uh, queries, they need um, high quality, accurate, credible journalism uh, to provide that. So we know that there's inherent value. Um, and I've been on a number of calls in the last 10 days on, you know, how do you come up with the valuation? Um, and there's, there's sort of a, a contrast between the pending copyright infringement cases and these deals, right? So these deals and people are, you know, uh, um, who are involved in negotiating getting, are getting information as what the numbers might be um, and uh, the components of the deals. Um, and what they include, the archives, and so on and so forth. Um, but what we know is they're not at the magnitude of what um, the litigation damages will be. So for copyright infringement, uh, statutory damages are $30,000 to $150,000 per infringed work, depending on the level of willfulness in the infringement. Now, you have the New York Times that just amended its complaint to add 7 million more works, right? So I think like the million, 10 million they had before. If you multiply that out, you're in the billions of dollars. These deals are not at that level. And yet, as you said, they are creating the market. So um, to the extent that you are not going to get statutory damages and it's going to be based on actual damages, um, an expert is going to look at this market, which is highly problematic. And you mentioned retrieval augmented generation. And just to level set here so we're all, you know, able to follow the conversation, basically the model training, those models are static. So to make it useful for a search engine or an answer engine, you use this retrieval augmented generation to get more timely, relevant results. And so they're basically scraping all of this data. Some of you might have, you know, read about the perplexity AI um, kerfuffle where they, I mean, perplexity AI doesn't create any content. They don't have any content, yet somehow they're able to provide all of this information. Um, you mentioned regurgitation earlier, Chris. Um, we might call it plagiarism. Uh, but 
as, you know, the, the other thing that we know about these artificial intelligence systems is that without humans, human created high quality content, the systems that are, if they're trained on synthetic content, other AI generated content, they will degrade and collapse over time, which means that they really need access for training as well as to make their applications more relevant. And so, you know, despite this parasitic relationship, um, AI companies, of course, have dismissed several copyright lawsuits as irrelevant and claim that the data extraction, as you said, is fair use. They've warned that data licensing would stall technological progress, even as they've inked deals with several, you know, large media organizations. So this raises a couple of issues. One is progress towards what, right? We've seen search degrade, you know, Facebook is full of zombie bots, et cetera. Again, in a fundamental year of elections. Um, and what about all of the other publishers who do, are not as fortunate to have excellent legal counsel like yourself, who don't have, you know, a, a team of lawyers, um, the, the you know, millions of publications around the world that are the long tail, the local news, what happens to the news ecosystem and what sort of policies do you think we can put in place to make sure that it's not just the biggest news companies that make the deal with the biggest tech companies? Well, the I mean, the industry's in its you know, final stages of extinction. Uh, and, um, <laughs> you know, we, we continue. I, I, I don't think the industry does as much anymore, but I think the We've done a poor job over the history of uh, the news business, particularly newspapers or what were known as newspapers, explaining the difference between what we do and what's done on television, certainly what's done on cable news. There is, we anger a lot of people all the time, but there is real rigor and cost that goes into the reporting. We endeavor to be right. We spend millions of dollars of doing it. And it is going away and close to gone. Um, there is no guaranteed future much longer for the Los Angeles Times. We uh, burn a tremendous amount of cash running the business. Uh, we lose newspapers every day, thousands. There's news deserts all over the country. And this isn't hyperbole. There's math that would show the importance of these organizations. And... They're mostly gone. Many are a shadow of themselves. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, ownership that has given us a uh, uh, longer run rate, more runway than most, but we have to solve this business model issue, and it, part of it, it comes with recognition of how important it is. It's, it is, uh, it goes beyond the people that work at the companies, it goes beyond the brands, and goes all the way with the uh, proliferation of this a AI technology to national security. I mean, we have now, um, if you're going to diminish the news the way Facebook has, that is going to uh, emphasize foreign actors who we know for sure are spreading disinformation. We know for sure, if you do read the news, uh, that that's having a corrosive impact on the country. So we we need to recognize as citizens the importance of these businesses, whether you like us or not, and whoever the us are, and regardless of ideology and those things, it's in the Constitution for a reason, and something needs to be done about it. And it's not just, I appreciate Senator Blumenthal, we've had a bill, I shouldn't say we, we don't really lobby, um, but there has been a bill in the United States Congress to compensate news organizations for the content that is stolen by the large digital platforms. It has a remarkable amount of bipartisan support. It has been sponsored by uh, Senator Kennedy in Louisiana, Senator Klobuchar, uh, Senator Graham, McConnell, uh, Schumer, and on down the list in the House from all kinds of different bedfellows, and uh, it's gotten very close, and, but it's yet to pass, um, maybe because nothing is passing. We have to get compensated. There has to be a, a recognition. There is some law that, that um, needs to uh, change as well, and it's just not and, – and, and further to that is we are held to a remarkably high standard. 
you have Google's AI returning to a certain prompt that a you know, young, I believe, American, I don't know, chess champion, uh, who was accused of cheating, that I believe that has been adjudicated through the courts. Not only did they say he cheated, but they, the technology said um, that uh, he admitted to cheating. We would be immediately sued. We are under constant threat. Uh, we have litigation all the time because we anger people for trying to tell the truth. Uh, for that one, we would be held liable, no question about it. Yet, once again, we move on with um, technology platforms being able to do what they want. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the lens that we uh, see this through is th these AI companies want to um, not have to pay for the raw materials to create their product. Um, and then they also don't want to disclaim liability um, for the outputs of their product. And yet, you know, we spend a tremendous amount investing in our journalism, and in particular our investigative journalism, which is the most expensive kind and yet can be the most impactful. Um, and then they just want to, you know, take it um, and then get it wrong, right, and, and, and disclaim any liability. We've seen this before in terms of the arguments um, that um, it would tank the industry if we were – um, uh, liable, and it would set back um, uh, innovation in the industry. Um, and it's sort of a, 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 it reminds me of what happened uh, prior to the passage of Section 230, which is the law that um, uh, provides a safe harbor to platforms for the content that they uh, publish on their platforms, right? There was a concern that there would be a tsunami of lawsuits, and as a result, uh, they got this immunity, and there was a lack of regulation here in the U.S., uh, which was not followed outside of the U.S., um, and led to a lot of the, ch the challenges that we found with the platforms um, going unchecked. And so I think this is a moment where we need to um, uh, be a little more rigorous in responding to um, those arguments that this is going to set back um, the industry and um, crush them with um, litigation. I think there are a lot of industries that would love to operate with no liability, right? I mean, if we had that right. in the pharmaceuticals industry, if we had that with driverless cars, where would we be? Why should this be treated any different? And there does seem to be this really interesting and rare bipartisan support on the journalism bill you mentioned. Also at the AI and journalism hearing um, earlier this year, like very strange bedfellows, but everyone looking at the use of journalism and saying like, that, that that's not fair use. It's can't possibly be, and AI, generative AI services applications do not have Section 230 immunity, and privately companies saying, like, yeah, of course, but as soon as they try to, like, just clarify that, you know, rallying their lobbying efforts against that. But, you know, in the few minutes we have left, I want to go back to the issue of, like, what happens? I mean, the, the survival of journalism is not just about the survival of journalism and democracy, also about these companies themselves. I mean, they do depend on journalism as a key input, a key extractive resource that they're using for their models. Yet we're seeing a survey of like 1,100 news publishers found that at least 70% of them are blocking AI crawlers. Um, NewsGuard just saw, just did a study that showed that the top 10 generative AI models mimic Russian disinformation claims and cite fake news sites as authoritative sources. And of course, we all know that, you know, Google's Gemini search engine, like, in its attempt to address bias, returns pictures of, like, black Nazis, right? So there's so many issues. How, how can we force the companies that rely on our information, our data, and I hate the word content because people literally pay with their lives and their liberty to bring news and to rec uncover news. It's not just a set of facts that sit out there for anyone to pick up. How do we force these companies? What do policymakers, if you could have one thing, what would, what would you have policymakers do tomorrow to force these companies to fairly compensate and ensure a sustainable business model? Huge liability. Okay. I mean, I think that's, you know, the litigation and the results of litigation, if there are billions of dollars of damages, if, um, if the legislation would account for that, 
that would change behavior. Yeah, and we don't really have time to wait for the law to, you know, the legal system. It's going to take several years. Meanwhile, the, the industry, as you said, Chris, is facing an extinction situation. Chris, what would you like to see? Well, I, th I think there's a, a couple simple things, uh, one of which is actionable, the JCPA that has gotten close to the past that would compensate for the use of uh, our information that we've created um, should be passed. Uh, passing it in California, um, and, you know, I would point federal legislators to California. I mean, for California legislators to be getting very close to passing very similar legislation when these companies are based in California and employ a tremendous amount of voters shows the courage necessary to get this done. And we have bipartisan support, so that is one. I don't think it's unrealistic to strengthen copyright law, which would do, which would address, because in my, I'm not an attorney, uh, uh, my experience in the news business has been just kind of a constant, well, copyright law, um, not going to really help, there's bad precedent, whatever it is, um, except when people pursue us <laughs> uh, for every now and then we've misused a photo, whatever it may be, somehow then copyright law is strong enough, but it's not when we try to enforce our own copyrights. And then the idea that these companies are not media companies and shouldn't follow the same and have the same risk of liability is preposterous. And I think, frankly, our industry may have contributed some to that over the years in that, you know, we'd like to be absolved from liability over user-generated content. And I think we've missed the mark over a number of years that we produce, we, we publish or distribute so little user-generated content. I'm not sure what we were protecting. Not that we're the loudest of voice, but we weren't aggressive enough in the early days. Um, and... I don't have a solution for, but the the companies that are reporting the news the right way and the difference between the editorial board and opinion and news is something the public doesn't understand. We've done a poor job in 200 years explaining that. But just core reporting of the news, there, we have to find a way where that information in this ecosystem is preferenced. Um, because I think we've learned that, you know, social media platforms pointing things just to people's interest does have a damaging impact. And we're not going to get the younger audiences back to our platforms organically. So I, I don't know how that's done, but there, you know, laws exist to save ourselves. Like, you know, I don't want to wear a, I don't like wearing a seatbelt. It wrinkles my suit. I wear a seatbelt because it's the law. Um, there's all kinds of that. There has to be some way uh, to do it because the future without it is a pretty, I think we're in the midst of living, is a pretty scary place. Absolutely. And, you know, Senator Blumenthal mentioned earlier, you know, we have all of these licensing regimes for other sectors, you know, safety requirements, licensing, and yet one of the most powerful and potentially dangerous sectors basically operates without any of those safeguards. Um, lots more to talk about. I think if you're listening to this and this is the first time you're thinking about this, I invite you to go to our website. We have a whole page on AI and journalism. You can delve into this. This is certainly not the end of a conversation. It's the beginning, but I'd like to thank our two panelists for an excellent discussion and uh, invite the audience to join us for a 15-minute coffee break. We will be back online live streaming in 15 minutes, but in the meantime, go grab a coffee, check out the website, and we'll be back soon.